Welcome back to another episode of The Road Chose Me. My name's Dan, and today it's time to run through the whys of my Overland Jeep Gladiator build. So I'm not gonna stand here and tell you that this is the ultimate or the best Overland vehicle, because that doesn't make any sense because it depends entirely on your needs. So what you don't want is for me to just tell you everything that I did, but not give you any rationale. What's more important is why did I do the modifications I did? And hopefully in watching this video, you'll be able to see if they make sense for your needs and if you wanna do something similar, or if you say, Dan, that doesn't make sense for me, I'm gonna do something totally different. In either case, I hope this video is helpful and gets you thinking about what you need out of an Overland vehicle. Because after all, the whole point is to build the vehicle that meets your needs and gets you out on adventure. So let's get right into it. Here are all of the whys of my Overland Jeep Gladiator build. So overall, I've chosen to build a Jeep Gladiator to drive around Australia. And tons of people ask why. And there's a lot of history there for me. My two Jeeps that I've had before have been really good to me. Never a single mechanical failure, all the way from Alaska to Argentina and all the way around Africa. But when it came to Australia, I want to get more remote than ever before. I need to carry more fuel, more food, more water. As well as that, I've got my partner Katie with me, who's behind the camera right now, and I would really love for my family to come with me as well. Hopefully dad will jump aboard, maybe my brother. So immediately, I need a bigger vehicle. I need to be able to transport three people, which means the Wrangler that I took around Africa, it just can't work. It didn't have a back seat. I converted all of that to living space. So right off the bat, I had to think of a vehicle that could transport three people, as well as all of the fuel and water and food that I needed. So that made me think I would like to have larger than my Jeep Wrangler. And so I chose a Jeep Gladiator. And yes, I definitely could have got a Land Cruiser Troopy. I could have got a Defender 110. Yes, there are lots of them here in Australia. And actually, that's the reason that I didn't get one. They've been done to death. Everybody knows exactly what they're like. I could just follow somebody else's build plan and driving down the street, it would just blend in with all the others. I decided the last thing in the world that Australia needed was another white Land Cruiser touring around the country. So I'm doing something a bit different. The Gladiator hasn't really been tested here in Australia yet. Is it fit for purpose? Is it going to work? Let's find out. Let's go and have adventures and I'll learn as I go and I'll adapt and I'll see, does this vehicle work well for Australian conditions? So when it comes to the front of the vehicle, this is a little bit more four wheel drive focused and not so much overland focused, but I do think these things are important parts of a build that you need to consider. Here in Australia, hitting a kangaroo is a very big concern. And so I chose to go with a steel bumper from AEV. These guys are the best of the best. I had their bumper on my previous Wrangler and after years and years of abuse in Africa, it still looks as good as the day I bought it. Obviously very strong radiator protection, that's key. And it even has a skid plate underneath to protect the steering components. For me, this is the best all-in-one integrated solution. I also love how it hides the winch. Obviously, there's a hundred different bumper considerations. My number one criteria though, make sure whatever you pick is legal in the countries you're planning on going to. A stubby bumper here in Australia, totally illegal. You know, a stinger sticking out the front, totally illegal. And even if it isn't technically illegal, down in Central America where you're thinking of going, you'll just be dealing with police all day, every day. My advice, don't do it. It's absolutely not worth it. Mounted, of course, in the bumper is a worn Xeon winch. I have spent years and years pondering whether I need to carry all that additional weight. And then when it saves my bacon because I make bad decisions, I know that it's worth having. So synthetic rope, Factor 55 hook on the front. This is the safest and strongest way to attach your winch to whatever you're attaching it to. I loved my last one. This is an improvement. And of course, lighting up the front as well. I've got some Light Force LED driving lights. These are a great Australian company, been making lights forever. Um, I've got their LED light bar mounted into the skid plate of the bumper as well. Again, driving at night, kangaroos are a massive consideration. And so for me, lighting up the road to avoid those kangaroo strikes is really important. That's why I've gone for the additional lighting on the front. 
under the hood here, or the bonnet as it's called in Australia, I've got the 3.6 litre Pentastar engine and it's got an eight speed automatic transmission. Why did I choose that for the Gladiator? I chose it because it's the only choice here in Australia. Would I have gotten the diesel if I could have? Yeah, I think I would have. I'm in a country or on a continent that has relatively high quality diesel. I think the diesel would have been a good choice. It's simply not available in Australia. Mounted at the back there, you can see an ARB single compressor, which I already used a lot to air up the tires. Why did I choose the single instead of the double? Because it's lighter, because it's cheaper, and because it takes up less space. Those are the key criteria for all the modifications I choose. I had that exact compressor for all the way around Africa, and it has been absolutely flawless. So I know that reliability and durability wise, it's up to the task and saving money is a huge part of my builds. I'm a regular guy, I'm not working for National Geographic or anything like that. I had to buy that with my own money. That means saving money and only getting the single instead of the dual means I have more time for adventures, which for me is my priority. All right, moving along the side of the vehicle here, I've chosen to install a CB radio. And part of that is simply because it's the law here in Australia. To cross some of the deserts that I want to, you have to have a radio. And so I permanently mounted actually inside the glove box. If I was going elsewhere in the world, I'm not a big fan of CB radios. They're actually illegal in some countries. The military in Morocco will give you a very hard time if you have a radio like this. And of course, if you're in a country like Nigeria or the Congo, there's no one on the other end of the radio to call anyway. So having one, I think, gives you a false sense of security. Obviously here in Australia, they are heavily used and I think it's an excellent idea. That's why I installed one on this vehicle. I haven't had one previously and I doubt that I'll have one in the future wherever I go in the world. Moving along a little bit, I've chosen to install a Rhino Rack roof rack on this Gladiator. Part of that is because I really wanna carry surfboards with me and obviously the roof rack is the perfect place for that. And up here, I've also mounted a Renogy solar panel. And this is a 100 watt flexible, lightweight solar panel. And you already know why I've done that. I've done that because it's lightweight. Again, these vehicles, the things we're building for overlanding, payload is our biggest consideration. I guarantee you all dedicated overland builds are at or above their legal weight rating. So for me to be able to save 10 or 20 pounds on five or 10 items, that's huge, that saves me hundreds and hundreds of pounds of weight. That's what I'm really focused on when I'm thinking about what am I adding to this vehicle? How am I making it heavier? For wheels and tires on this Gladiator, I've chosen to run Yokohama's XAT Geolanders. And these are their aggressive all-terrain tires. And I actually think these are the best on the market right now, simply because they are so new. These are designed much more recently than competing products from BF Goodridge or others. They're much quieter, they're much longer lasting. And for my needs, these are a perfect blend. They perform well in many, many scenarios rather than just being excellent at one scenario, but then average at others like a mud terrain would be. For wheels, these are actually the Mopar spare wheels. This comes with the Gladiator. So I just bought five of them, I had them powder coated and the spare is exactly the same wheel and tire, also a very important consideration for overlanding. I chose to run steel wheels just because of how durable they are. It won't crack, and even if it deforms on a rock or some other impact, I should be able to beat it back into shape with a sledgehammer, at the very worst, get it welded by someone with a stick welder, versus if I had aluminium wheels, that would be the end of the wheel, and I'd probably have to get one shipped in from somewhere else. In terms of the size of tires that I've spec'd here, these are 33s, which are actually the same as I ran on my Jeep around Africa. These are 285 70 17s. Why did I choose that size? Why don't I have 35s or even 37s like so many in America do? Well, first of all, those are illegal in Australia, very strict laws here. So once again, if you're planning to take your vehicle international, think about what the laws are in the countries you're going to. Driving a vehicle that's illegal not worth it, you'll have a lot of trouble, the police will give you a lot of hassle, and here in Australia, you would just be put off the road and you can't drive the vehicle. Furthermore, I'm not gonna run 35s, the vehicle would be heavier, it would use more fuel, more wear and tear on all the steering and suspension. The list of reasons is endless, you can check out my previous video, but that's why I'm running 33s. I think they're the best choice for really long-term overlanding. 
while we're down here too, I should mention suspension, one of the most important components of an Overland build. That is the final piece of my puzzle that I have not actually solved yet. So to correctly spec the suspension, I need to get this thing on a set of scales, figure out how much it weighs, then find an appropriate suspension. It's not about how high you lift your vehicle when you're overlanding, it's about carrying the weight correctly. Here at the back of the Jeep, I've got a Renogy charge controller and a lithium ion 50 amp hour battery. And they're a little bit hard to see. I tucked them in here beside the third seat. But what's great about the Renogy is you don't actually need to see it because with the Bluetooth module, I have an app on my phone right here and it's actually telling me the status of the whole system right now. So even though it's really late in the day, we're making a tiny amount of solar right now. I can see my battery is at 78% of capacity and we've been sitting here for two days now without running the engine. So that tells me the solar panels keeping up with the fridge and my laptop charging and all of that. And another really great thing, people are asking me, is the 50 amp hour battery enough or should I have gone to the 100? Well, I can tell you I've had the system for 112 days. I've generated 21 kilowatts of power. Uh, the battery has been fully charged 80 times and it has been discharged zero times. So in 112 days, I have never completely discharged the battery or discharged it enough to be a problem. That tells me 50 amp hours is enough for my needs. And the reason that I went with lithium, you're going to ask, it's smaller and it's lighter than any of the other options on the market. As well as that, the battery will take a charge much faster. So this charge controller is designed to really shunt power into it much, much faster, and it's way more efficient to charge. And then finally, why the Renogy charge controller? There certainly are some good options here from Aussie companies. The Renogy is literally a quarter, even a fifth of the price of the other options on the market. It's a solar charge controller. It's a DC to DC charger, and it has the Bluetooth module so I can use my phone to monitor it. It's literally one stop. Of course, I've added the solar panel as well. This does everything that I need, and I never even have to think about it, Already, this is one of my favorite systems on the Jeep because it works. It wasn't expensive and it works. Those are my favorite systems. All right, so on the back of the Gladiator here, I've chosen to use a canvas canopy. And I had this thing custom made. Why did I do that? Primarily, it's about weight. Obviously, if I'm gonna have a pickup truck or a ute, I need some sort of covering to protect everything that's in the back. And I could have used aluminum, I could have used fiberglass. Obviously, there's lots of campers on the market from AT Overland, Go Fast Campers. All of those work and I think they're great options, but they're all going to be heavy, like five, six, seven hundred pounds of heavy. And while I haven't had this on the scale yet, I guarantee it's right around its weight capacity. That means anything that I add like that, I'm just subtracting from what I can bring in terms of gear. So for me, this was purely a weight consideration and I wanted to see how it goes as well. I'm kind of like this lightweight approach, not just literally in terms of weight, but also in terms of kind of maintenance and burden. How heavy does it feel on my shoulders? A nice lightweight canvas canopy, it just feels simple. It feels nice. It's what I had from Alaska to Argentina and I kind of missed it in my Africa Jeep. That's why I did it this time. And you can see too that I'm standing under a ginormous batwing awning. This is from Rhino Rack. Why did I choose to go with an awning like this this time? It's because I wanted more outdoor living space. The weather in Australia is pretty good. Here we are on the beach. I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. Life's pretty good. But I wanted shade protection. I wanted rain protection. And I wanted it to be outside so I can actually enjoy the great outdoors. So the whole idea was big outdoor living space. We can sit in our chairs under here. We can put our swag under here and it extends all the way around the back and covers the kitchen and the whole food prep area as well. So for me, it was about outdoor living space is why I chose an awning like this. We'll come this way as well. I did just mention that we're using a swag as a sleeping setup this time. And why did I choose a swag rather than some sort of integrated pop-up? I don't like rooftop tents. I think they're really heavy. They're up too high. They're really bad for wind resistance. So what is a swag? A swag's kind of like a durable Australian tent. Australians have been using these things for decades and they love them. Makes me think there's something about them that must be good. I don't really know, I've never had one before. So for me, this is about doing whatever the locals do and learning from what the locals do. 
if they've been using them for decades and they love them, there's gotta be something to it. So for me, I wanna experiment and I wanna learn what can I learn from using a swag that I can incorporate into future trips wherever I happen to go in the world. And then we move on to the back of the Gladiator, which is kind of like Camp Central in my setup. And obviously, if you've got a pickup truck, you could choose to be living in the back of it, actually sleeping up in there, or you could choose to be outside of it like I am. And the reason I did this is because the bed of the Gladiator is only five feet long. I'm six feet two. So even if I put a mattress in there, it's not really gonna work unless I sleep with the tailgate down and blah, blah, blah. I just never even decided that I was going to do that. So instead what I've done is I've installed a water tank over on this far side of the Jeep. So this is a 53 liter water tank. There's a pump, there's a filter. I have drinking water on demand that I can actually just spray out of this nozzle. Drinking water to me is essential on my trips. My Africa setup, I use the water every single day. And already here in Australia, we're relying on it heavily. So in my overland vehicles, storage of drinking water is a real priority. Next to that, I've got a couple of drawers that I installed. These I don't particularly love. They're heavy, they're kind of clunky, but they do get me access to things that otherwise would be way down the back of the bed. With a pickup truck, I don't actually know of a better way to get things out than having drawers. That's something, if I got a pickup truck again, I would try to improve on that, but it's working for now, so I'm going to leave it and see what I think as time goes on. Then we move over here to the big new kitchen that I got. This is Overland Kitchens Truck Bed Expedition Kitchen. And I've only had this thing a couple of weeks, used it extensively, and I'm really enjoying it. Dometic fridge here, this is the 55 ice maker. Um, why did I choose that one? Dometic constantly rates in the best for power consumption. It uses very low power. I had a Dometic for all of my travels around Africa. That fridge never missed a beat and some extremely hot conditions it was operating under, it still works perfectly. So in terms of durability and reliability, I didn't even hesitate buying another Dometic. Uh, I do have the insulated cover on it because it will increase the performance of the fridge. And this is the ice maker. Why did I get that? I thought it'd be fun to be able to put ice in drinks. Only used it once so far. I'll let you know if it turns out actually to be useful or not. On the front of the fridge, I've got my cutlery holder that I designed. For me, cooking is a huge part of my expeditions. I do it to save money. I do it because I enjoy it so much. And I do it because I'd rather be out here camping on the beach than running into town and buying something for dinner. That doesn't really appeal to me. If I'm gonna be cooking a lot, I want it to be convenient. So all of my most used items are right here on my cutlery holder. I've got my fry pan here. I've got all my most used food in easy reach. And of course, a huge cutting board. If I'm gonna be cutting up vegetables and meat and pre prepping food, maximum prep surface is what I'm looking for. Moving down a little bit further at the end of the kitchen, we have the Coleman two burner dual fuel stove. Why do I use that one? It's because I really like having a stove that burns gasoline or petrol because that's what the Jeep burns. It means anywhere in the world that I can fill the Jeep up, I know that I have fuel for my stove. And yet here in Australia, I probably could have used a propane bottle, you know, like a gas tank and a regular old sort of barbecue, but those are heavy, those are bulky. And for me, this is training for wherever I'm going to go in the world. And I know those propane bottles, they don't work very well in the rest of the world. So I'm practicing and I'm training so that when I get to Kazakhstan, when I get to Iran, this will be the setup I have and I'll already be so familiar with it and comfortable with it. On top of the stove right now, I've got one of the pots that I use. This is just an MSR pot set, usually sort of for backpacking. This is the exact stove pot setup that I had for all of Africa. These things were brilliant. And so I bought exactly the same set again because they are so good and I just knew that it would work. And then in terms of why did I choose this kitchen in particular, it's because it's the best one that I could find on the market. There are a lot of Aussie companies that make kitchens for the back of a ute or a pickup truck. I find most of them, they dedicate about 60% of their space to washing up dishes. I don't know why Australians are obsessed with washing up dishes. I've never wanted dish wash up space and to dedicate a lot of space to that, I think is a real waste. Uh, I personally just fill up a pot with hot soapy water and do my dishes there and then sit them here to dry. 
Also, a lot of the ones on the Australian market, they're really heavy, they're made out of steel. They have legs that fold down. I don't want legs that fold down if I'm camping in the mud or on some uneven surface. I much prefer my vehicle to be freestanding. And then finally too, a lots of them, they're really inefficient in the way they use space. There's one in particular, maybe the leader in the market, the way that all the different segments fold out, when they fold back in, there's an enormous amount of wasted space that has to be there because of the folding mechanism. So for me, when I looked at all of those, I was like, oh, they're all kind of weak in a certain area versus this one that Al at Overland Kitchen designed. I think this is the best one I've ever seen for a pickup truck. But if you know of a model, let me know. I'd love to see what else is out there. So that's why I chose this one in particular. Over here on the side of the Jeep 2, I have installed an auxiliary fuel tank underneath. And this is a tank by the Long Ranger, sold by ARB here in Australia. I've never done that on my Overland vehicles before. Why did I do it this time? I did it because I need the extra range and I don't want to deal with siphon hoses. I don't want the smell of gasoline. I don't want to get it on my hands. And already I've used this thing extensively and I really, really love it. When you're at the gas pump, you can choose which tank you're filling up, whether you fill the main or whether you fill the auxiliary. And then when I'm driving, I just hit the little button on the dashboard and it transfers it across into the main tank. It's a pretty fun thing to watch the fuel gauge go up while you're driving, not commonly done on a Jeep, but so far loving the fuel tank and it's gonna enable some really remote adventures, which for me is essential. And then finally, the snorkel that I've installed. This is from AEV. Again, they make amazing products. I rolled my Africa Jeep onto its snorkel and it barely even scratched it. So I know this thing's tough and durable. Why do I have one though? Lots of people say you don't need a snorkel. I think it totally depends on where you're going in the world. Yeah, if I was driving up to Alaska, I wouldn't have a snorkel. When I drove Alaska to Argentina, I didn't have a snorkel and I didn't need one. But for Africa, 100% I needed a snorkel. There were a handful of river crossings that came over the bonnet, the hood of the Jeep, and the dust was absolutely insane. And to be honest, I expect exactly the same thing here in Australia. Up in Cape York, when I drive the old telly track, water will come over the bonnet, that is a fact. And the dust here is also intense, and I plan to do tens of thousands of miles in that dust. So for me, a quality snorkel with an air filter built into it absolutely essential that's why i have one so i hope that video has been helpful and i hope as always that it gets you thinking about what you need in your overland vehicle and don't fall into the trap of believing anyone that tells you they have the ultimate vehicle or any magazine that says this is the best overland build because that's just not possible you have different needs, you want to go to different parts of the world than whoever built that vehicle for whatever uses it had. So remember, it's about what you need, it's not about what someone else tells you you need. So if it has been helpful, do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel. We're getting out on our adventures now all around Australia. I can't wait to show you what this looks like. It is absolutely beautiful. So until next time, have fun out there and maybe I'll bump into you on the road.